Welcome back to Understanding Economics. Our last segment was Frequently Asked Questions, and a question came up at the end that I figured we'd better hold over. It's a big one. It deserves in-depth consideration. We've been making the argument that the rent of land and natural resources is far and away the best source of public revenue. The sensible next question is, well, all right, is there enough land rent to fund all the needs of government? The conventional wisdom in mainstream economics says no way, not nearly enough. But we've already seen how the magnitude of the land issue is downplayed and minimized in conventional economic analysis. So how much rent is there? Alas, this question is harder to answer than you might expect. If you think about it, that isn't really surprising. As we've seen, the rent of land is the major source of unearned income in our society. The capacity to, to collect unearned income is an important opportunity. You can expect people to take advantage of it in every conceivable way. They slice and dice it, spend it now, let it sit and sell it later, take out loans against it, enjoy it as part of their stock portfolio. We've been discussing the three factors of production as though they are perfectly distinct and separable. And well, they're certainly distinct. Labor is human exertion. Capital is the material stuff that's used in the process of production. And land is a natural opportunity. But separable, that can be a little tricky. We could think of the factors as three colors of paint poured into the overall pool of production. Labor is red, capital is blue, and land is green. It's all mixed up. Mainstream economics would have us think that this mixed upness is just the way it is. If that's true, then the distribution of wealth is simply a matter of power. More goes to whoever dips in the biggest scoop. Georgists would say no, not necessarily anyway. The proper division of wealth between individuals and the community is not a matter of the amount of wealth, but of the source of wealth. Remove the green land component, the rent, and use it for the needs of the community before it gets all mixed in. Then instead of a muddy brownish gray, the income of productive private people can be appropriately purple. Yet we still have to answer the question of how much rent there is. Is it even enough to worry about? What does the data say? And if the evidence is insufficient, shouldn't we hire experts to study it so we can answer this question once and for all? We've said that in technical terms, it's not difficult to accurately assess land value. Towns and cities could do this properly. For the most part, they don't. But if they did, we could just add it all up to provide a reasonably accurate estimate of surface land value. We'd still have to reckon with the air and water, ecosystem services, and other natural opportunities such as broadcast rights. Unfortunately, though, property tax assessment is done by a zillion different local agencies using their own methods and subject to their own homegrown political pressures. What aggregate records are kept are often unreliable. And large cities, where land values are the highest and the most politically significant, tend to have the most inaccurate land assessments. It's widely known that urban land has by far the highest value. For example, according to the New York City Assessor's Office, the average value of an acre of land in the five boroughs of New York City is $1.9 million. In Manhattan, the figure is $8 million per acre. In Center City, Philadelphia, a figure of $4.7 million has been reported. Bear with me, when we get into numbers with this many zeros, it becomes hard to keep things in perspective. A 2013 study by the Henry George Institute which compared assessed values with comparable sale prices, conservatively estimated the true market value of land in New York City at roughly three times the value reported by the assessors. Pricey Manhattan sites are routinely underassessed by a factor of 10 or more. Meanwhile, a widely cited 2015 study by William Larson of the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis estimates the total value of land in the United States, private and public, at approximately $23 trillion. Seems like a lot. This study acknowledges that urban land has by far the greatest value, estimating that the average value of an acre of land in cities with over a million people is, wait for it, $64,600. What gives? Meanwhile, a report on the website 24-7 Wall Street, which breaks down average per acre land value in the U.S. by state, 
cites the state of Maryland as having an average land value of $75,000 and change per acre. That's urban and rural land, and Maryland is more than two-thirds rural. Suffice it to say that the existing data on aggregate land values is too fuzzy to really be useful. Now the picture is a bit clearer in Australia, because Australia has a long tradition of recording land assessments separately from improvements, and in many places collecting land value taxes. Data on aggregate rent is easier to uncover there. In a 2003 study, Dr. Terry Dwyer surveyed Australian land value records from 1911 to 1999 and showed privately collected land rent to be as much as 26% of Australian GDP, more than the 24% of GDP currently collected in taxes. Good news for us. Unfortunately, no other country has kept the sort of records that would allow Dwyer's methods to be applied elsewhere. So for the most part, we lack hard data on the precise amount of land rent that exists in today's economy. Nevertheless, we do know a few things, and the signs are encouraging. In recent years, an economic insight known as the Henry George Theorem has taken its place in the toolkit of mainstream economics. This idea was initially explored and published by Nobel laureates Joseph Stiglitz and William Vickery, among others. It states that, in effect, the rental value of land in a city tends to equal the cost of an optimal level of public infrastructure and services. In other words, an efficient city can fully fund itself on just the rent of its land. They do not need, as cities do today, to levy any taxes on sales, income, or buildings. At first glance, this would seem to suggest that land rent is probably enough to provide for local revenue, but what about higher levels of government? Wouldn't we need to go beyond land rent to bring in sufficient revenue? Possibly, but there are some points to make about that. The first, of course, is simply the moral argument that land rent is the just and efficient source of public revenue, therefore we should resort to no other taxes until all the land rent has been collected. But of course, we're very far from that point today, as is shown by our huge land prices and rampant land speculation. But there are also dynamic forces to consider. We've noted that if a city shifts its property taxation toward land and away from buildings, it's likely to see a surge in new construction and business activity. This will increase its land values, which in turn will give it more land rent to collect as economically healthy public revenue. The newly increased rent could be a surplus used to defray other taxes or to make further investments in civic improvement. And if every city were to do this, then they would all see this sort of improvement. Eventually, they would need fewer federal dollars for welfare and education. If these cities continued in this positive direction, funds would flow up from them to the state and federal governments, not the other way around as it is now in programs which are marked by corruption and inefficiency. If we're going to imagine the effects of this all-encompassing shift in public policy, we must not see the economy as a zero sum. Distribution is not just a matter of dividing up a static or even shrinking pie of wealth. There's a great deal of unused productive capacity in our economy today, and the shift to a Georgia's tax policy could start putting it to work. Or, to put it another way, Right now, all the land that is unused or grossly underused yields little or no rent. In a Georgist economy, however, it will, and that rent will be available for public revenue. Remember how when labor and capital got access to the best land, across the board production figures went up, unemployment was eliminated, and infrastructure funds went further? If one city improves its economy by shifting to land value taxation, it would draw people in business away from other cities. But if every city shifted to land value taxation, the increase in production would be general. It wouldn't be at anyone else's expense. This may seem a bit abstract, so let's consider a concrete, the concrete effect of just one small part of this overall remedy. Think of how popular local sales tax holidays are. A city announces no sales taxes this week and business skyrockets. Here's a Google Earth image showing shopping centers in this region of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. Which of these four states do you suppose has no sales tax? Sales taxes, a reliable and perversely popular source of revenue in our society, severely inhibit business. 
They're not just unnecessary, they are counterproductive. We could eliminate them. We can expect a shift to land value tax system to yield great economic benefits. Undoubtedly, it would increase production. Now here's a quiz question, which ought to be easy to answer at this point in our adventure. When overall production increases, what happens to the proportional share of rent? That's right, it goes up. That suggests that even if we did know the amount of aggregate rent in today's economy, we would nevertheless not know the amount of aggregate rent in a society that adopted the Georgist remedy. Well, we'd know one thing about it, aggregate rent would be much greater than it is now. To see why this, so, this is so, let's briefly recap what we've learned about the fundamental principles of wealth distribution. We seek to satisfy our desires with the least exertion, using our labor to produce wealth, usually with the aid of capital. We need ground on which to live and work. Labor can always produce more capital, material stuff, if it can get access to land. But land is fixed in supply. No more can be produced. Labor will not work for any less than the amount it can get on the average where the land is free. But if there's no free land available, the general rate of wages falls to the level of bare subsistence and rent soaks up all the surplus. This should be a review for you by now, right? Since there is no free land today, competition among workers and capital owners has already pushed wages and interest down to the lowest levels that they can accept. Any attempt to tax production will tend to push wages below that acceptable level. Workers will stop producing. Therefore, if the process of production is taxed, which it is heavily taxed in our society, the burden of that taxation tends to fall on the wealth that would otherwise have gone to rent. Thus, if taxes on labor and capital are eliminated, rent will increase. It will increase by at least the amount that taxes on labor and capital are lowered which means that in a society that eliminated taxes on production and raised public re revenue from land values, the rent fund, aggregate rent, would be greater than the total amount of taxes collected now from all sources. The bad news is that we don't have the data to precisely calculate the present level of aggregate rent, and we can't have the data to estimate what aggregate rent would be in a Georgist economy. The good news is that the aggregate rent in a Georgia's economy would certainly be much greater than it is now, and this rent would go not into the pockets of parasitic landlords, but to the needs and desires of the whole community. Thanks for watching, everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with video work by Uladzimir Takrachu. In our next segment, we explore how Henry George's remedy affects our environmental challenges.